Okay, thank you so much, uh, everyone. This is a wonderful, gorgeous place to share some thinking about education. It's so wonderful to just take some time and dive into the topic that we have today. Um, by way of introduction, I'm based in Boston, but I'm from New York, so I'm really happy to be in my home state. And um, in Boston, I'm an associate professor at um, MGH's graduate school called the Institute of Health Professions. I help train speech language pathologists and reading specialists, and then I also also teach at the Harvard Grad School of Education, a class on reading difficulties, and collaborate at MIT where I do my neuroscience research. So I come to you as a person with clinical, um, working. I, I have a clinical background that I work in the clinic and um, work with kids who have learning disabilities on the diagnostic side, and from the researcher side, from the cognitive neuroscience hat, um, and from the educator side, which we are all here invested in the same community. So I'm so glad to be here. Uh, so just for me to get a sense of you who here is from New York. That's the easiest question, right? OK, yeah, so we all already have so much in common. Great. Um, how many of you work with students in elementary school? OK, and middle school, high school, younger than um, elementary school, or older than high school? OK, so we cover the wide range of ages. Um, what I'm looking forward to talking with you today in an interactive way, so at any time, please let me know what would be more interesting to dive deeper into, um, is the idea behind myths and misconceptions. What that really means is that we all come to the table with the best intentions, the training that we were able to subscribe, our intuitive sense as educators, and everything else you have an intuitive sense about from your experience with, with um, kids, whether it's parents, uncles, aunts, et cetera. Um, but but we're prone to learn an idea and then hang by it. And I want to just identify for us in real time common ideas that sometimes have misconceptions attached to them and ask you to complete a quiz in real time. And then we also will go through the results and identify as a group how consistent are we with thinking about the science behind ideas and how can we empower our, our thinking in ways that are science-based. The big deal here is not that this will impact your training tomorrow, but it will downstream. The idea being that if you have misconceptions, the impact of those is not just that you have those ideas, but that they can then impact your thinking or your training or your interactions or your otherwise um, uh, efforts in the classroom, which of course um, we know that people are not aiming for that whatsoever. Um, and that's also in contrast to all of the ideas that are great that people have and hold on to that are scientifically um, oriented. The issue isn't so much also our ideas, but they're the community that we work with who might be susceptible or vulnerable to ideas that derail from productive lines of thinking. What I mean by that is um, the perspectives of caretakers and educators have a couple of themes that have come through, one of them being that educators and parents alike really have a lot of confusion around the definition and causes of learning disabilities. Um, there are also a lot of things that we know that can help, but uh, risk factors, for example, are often under-recognized, and the stigma can really interfere with pursuing resources and interventions. So each of those themes, I want to show you where they came from and unpack those a bit. When I, ta when I talk about misconceptions and, bias and um, myths, the important thing to highlight is a lot of times it's not intended, it's not an explicit idea that may be propagating. It might be because of something that's more implicitly driven. So I want to just bring to your attention, should you ever in your professional communities or um, after this is over, just wanted to get a sense of what is implicit bias and what role might that play. Um, I wanted to just share with you a resource that might be useful at the um, Harvard Psychology Department. They have a whole website um, of all sorts of implicit biases tests you can take, including one on disability. So IAT is the Implicit Apperception Test. And it's a resource that you may find useful in your own communities to address um, the, the existence of implicit bias, the impact, the prevalence, and with facing it, um, it provides an opportunity to discuss and address it. And I'm priming us with this idea of implicit bias because of what um, I want to share from a recent study. There was a research effort that wanted to explore if teachers' perceptions, both implicit and explicit, had an impact on the student outcomes. And so they would ask teachers their explicit attitude, just you know, what do you think or what would you say? Um, 
about uh, students with disabilities like dyslexia. And they also did a test something like the implicit apperception test where you um, look into someone's implicit uh, attitude toward an idea, how quickly you might associate it with a positive or negative um, uh, word compared to more neutral um, categories. And what was so surprising was that in this study they found that the implicit, let's see, the explicit perceptions had no relationships um, or correlations with the student achievement in the classrooms, but the implicit it did. And that was a really powerful finding because it highlighted that it's not just what we are able to articulate in terms of our perceptions, but in our communities there may be part of what, uh, there may be some implicit biases that may be driving the relationships, the expectations, um, and the standards that we hold our students to. So I'm just highlighting this as a, a way of entry to say that even with the best um, um, conscious approaches, there may be ways in which implicit bias are impacting directly uh, or indirectly the students in our classrooms. Building off of that, this idea of how Often people attribute learning disabilities to inaccurate causes. In our communities, we have about a third of people attributing learning disabilities to causes that were inaccurate. What does that entail? About 20% thinking that it's caused by watching too much TV, or by a poor diet, or by childhood vaccination. We know that one is 100% debunked and mostly linked to the autism story. Um, and this is even more extreme when we think of the word laziness. I can say as a person with clinical background that laziness is not a diagnosis, but all of us have heard someone referred uh, in, to in that way in the classroom setting. And the way I think about it is uh, the word or the phrase uh, calling someone lazy is just the lowest hanging fruit of a word you could use. It's just an easy one to assign generally, but it reflects a lack of nuance and a lack of understanding or a lack of vocabulary that would make it possible to understand why is someone performing in the way that we're observing. And about half of the public thinks that learning, learning disabilities are the result of laziness. And that's a staggering number when we think of how many of us don't think that and would hate for that to be um, more than zero. Um, so to highlight a couple of more uh, issues here, this idea of um, risk factors being underappreciated is under this whole umbrella as well. And when we think of how parents view behaviors of children age three to four, so before these kids get to school, um, what we're seeing is that the orange bars are indicating sign of a serious problem and blue is indicating perceptions that um, kids will grow out of this. And just to highlight the very last one, having trouble rhyming is a very robust um, red flag for children who may later end up with something like dyslexia or reading difficulties. But 76% of parents don't recognize that or don't have the guidance from their, um, from their community, whether it's pediatricians or otherwise that can help them be aware that that's a red flag to dive into and to be alert to. And similarly, having trouble with numbers, alphabet, days of the week, etc., and a couple other features here as well. So to highlight this a little bit further, this laziness question um, is extended to classroom teachers. About a third of classroom teachers and other educators believe sometimes what people call a learning or attention issue is really just laziness. So it's not just out there, people who may not be plugged into our world, it's in our world as well. And about 40% of parents say they wouldn't want others to know if their child had learning disabilities. So this stigma piece not only is um, impeding kind of parents plugging into a community, but this last point here, doctors who recommend having a child evaluated for learning and attention issues say parents follow the recommendation only about half of the time. And so this idea that stigma is limiting the proactivity or the pursuit of resources is something to highlight for us as well. The last few slides I shared are from an excellent resource that I highly recommend. It's in your slide deck at the very end as a recommended resource, but there is an organization called the National Center for Learning Disabilities. Um, they also helped make the website understood.org. So if that isn't a resource that's on your radar, I strongly encourage you to um, consider uh, if it'd be useful. The website is understood.org. And the organization is the National Center 
for learning disabilities. So that's in the citation at the bottom of this slide, but at the very end of your slide deck, there's also um, the citations for these resources listed as well. So NCLD, the National Center for Learning Disabilities, they actually put out a publication for free every couple of years called the State of Learning Disabilities. And they collect data, they compile and put into really useful infographics. Um, and they had one come out, the most recent one was 2017. Um, and the previous one was about two years before that. So they just have a really excellent com compilation of resources um, on learning and attention issues. They are, um, their website, unsur.org, is intended for parents, but it's extremely useful for everybody. And they're currently in the process of making one for educators in, in specific. So that's on its way. OK, so I want to highlight for you this idea of a neuro myth um, uh, extending beyond behavioral myths. So what is it? It's a misconception that's generated by misunderstanding or misquoting facts scientifically based, uh, miscommunication. Often there's some element of sound science that makes them hard to refute, uh, but sometimes it's taking things too far, too far extrapolated um, or otherwise. Why do they happen and why do they get propagated? What is this about? Uh, well, first, there's such an earnest interest in applying brain findings to education, and there's a vast uh, difference in the training that educators have and neuroscientists have. Um, there tends to be a bias. If I were to show you data and add a picture of a brain, even if it were irrelevant, um, there's a study showing that your judgment of the scientific, um, the scienceness of that article would be elevated just because of the brain picture there. Um, and uh, there's this, this, there's this issue that failed replications don't make the headlines. So this evolving, self-correcting nature of science is also playing a role. What I want to do is make it real for us. So on the next slide, I'm going to actually have us start a quiz. Uh, not a quiz, um, uh, an interactive activity. Many of you may have used Kahoot before. If you haven't, you're about to. If you have, uh, that's wonderful. So we're going to invite everyone in this room and anyone who's also um, off-site to join this. And I'm going to, uh, you'll require the internet through your computer or through your phone. OK, so we're going to have 10 questions. And you'll see the question and the uh, options here. So we use 10% of our brain. True or false? That was just our first one. It looks like there's not 100% agreement in the room. It looks like 32 people got the answer correct that it's false. And 11 people thought otherwise and we'll discuss. And that is onwards to the next one. So let's try this next one. Oh, and here's the scoreboard. OK, so if you see your initials up there, that means you answered the fastest and correctly. Here is the next one. Some of us are left or right-brained, and this helps explain differences in how we learn. True or false? This is a similar split to the last one. This is really great to see. So it looks like about 33 people were accurate in saying false and 14 thought otherwise and I would love to hear and talk this through that's going to be the best part of this so here's the scoreboard and here is the next one individuals learn better when they receive information in their preferred learning style true or false Okay, so this is gonna be a really fascinating one and I will tell you that this is fairly consistent in different groups that I have done this with and I would really, this is gonna be one of the first ones we'll discuss and walk through here. So, uh, scoreboard and the next question. A common sign of dyslexia is seeing letters backwards. True or false? The stats are so consistent, it's amazing. Okay, so we've got 
33 people again thinking that is false and um, and we'll talk about the rest of it, <laughs> okay? This is so great. Hopefully you're finding this informative to see how consistent ideas may or may not be. Um, let's take a peek here and then try our next question, which is, listening to classical music increases children's reasoning ability. True or false? All right, so this may be the most um, differential so far, so some people thought true. Most of you got the answer false, which I would agree with. Uh, we'll talk about that one again. Here's our scoreboard, and here is our next question. We use our brains 24 hours a day. True or false? <laughs> okay, so 40 people endorse that, um, and um, I'll have to say this. I'll just address this one right now. <laughs> uh, if you are if you are alive, <laughs> you are probably one of the most fortunate people to have your entire brain operating on all fronts all the time. Um, so when we're sleeping, when we're daydreaming, when we're um, even uh, not conscious in different degrees of what that what that would mean. Um, that that would be the why that would would be voted as true. Happy to discuss that and think it through with anyone. In the meantime, we'll try our next question. Extended rehearsal of some mental processes can change brain structure or function. True or false? So the good news is every single one of you working in schools in any capacity are active changers of brains. Okay, and because education is changing behavior and thinking, extended rehearsal is what you're highlighting. Um, yes, so the nuance of these questions sometimes sway them more false or otherwise, but the idea that changing behavior changes minds, which changes brain structure or function, is an intact idea that we have a lot of evidence for. This extended rehearsal, I think in this context, is meant to refer to when you're learning, it's unusual that a single exposure of something makes you learn it. And so this extended rehearsal, I think, is trying to address the idea that when you are repeatedly exposed to things and engaged in that exposure in ways that make it meaningful to you, what you're doing is not only learning, but when learning happens, it's changing the brain in ways that are meaningful structurally and functionally. Okay, so almost to the end. Exercises that rehearse coordination of motor perception skills can improve literacy, true or false. Okay, so this one's also great to see, right? Because it's, it's, um, there's a spread across the group here and that's consistent when we've given this uh, in, in other places. So the people, th this one actually is the most, most lopsided for the number of people who accurately identified it. Um, motor perception skills, there are a lot of literacy programs, not a lot, but some that um, aim to improve literacy not directly through literacy exposure, reading or writing or even language, but more through motor perceptual based activities. Um, and to my knowledge, yet, not yet, have I seen research based evidence that that's an effective path toward reading. Um, also something I'm happy to discuss and work through with specific resources and citations, etc. cetera. Um, let's get us to the ninth question here. Learning problems associated with differences in brain function cannot be improved by education. True or false? All right, so this one, majority, uh, 
have spoken that learning problems, so with any learning problems are often based in the way that the brain is wired. Um, but education's whole purpose is meant to address and accommodate and work with students to meet them where they are. It doesn't always work effectively, but um, I, would, I would say this was a false one. And I would say that this is part of the reason why all of us are proactively engaged with communities with children who have learning challenges um, because there are always things we can do to support them. Um, one more here. Children must be exposed to an enriched environment from zero to three years old or lose learning capacity. True or false? All right, so here we've got um, 16 people flagging that as false, and that's accurate. Um, the, there are a lot of extreme words in this sentence, okay? So one of them is must be exposed, another one is enriched environment, another one is lose learning capacity. So um, it's not accurate to say that obligatorily experiences that happen in years zero to three will dictate the trajectory that remains for the rest of their life in terms of learning. Um, and the enrichment in zero to three, many children are coming from environments that don't have access to resources, let alone enrichment opportunities early in life, who go on to be equally more or more or otherwise successful compared to their peers. So highlighting these, at least as a start, to show you how people vary in their responses, I hope gets us oriented to thinking about the whole story behind why it matters so much to know what people think, because the consequences of those thinking, of those thoughts, will uh, likely have impacts in, in actions. So I wanted to share with you a research study where we, um, administered and completed this quiz um, with a lot of other people. So I'm gonna just load up my slides again to show you that. Okay, so here we are. Um, so I just wanna give credit to the team that was behind this. There's a website called Test My Brain, um, uh, and it has a lot of different, .org, it has a lot of different research projects. This one's no longer posted there, but other ones are. So this was done in collaboration with our colleagues, including um, Dr. Laura Germain, who's from the Harvard Med School, who's started this website. Um, so what we found when we asked questions, uh, we got several thousand people to answer this. Some had an education background, some had a neuroscience background, and otherwise it was a general public. And we split up their answers to see what proportion of them, that, were there any differences based on their, the training or the background of people. So I'll just flash forward to the end, because this is just building it up. Um, so first you'll see that some of the, the two top ones are the ones that fewest people uh, accurately identified as a myth. So all of these listed here are myths. They are not accurate statements, including a common sign of dyslexia, seeing letters backwards, and that individuals learn better when they receive information in their preferred learning style. And the fewest people identify those as correct um, across the board. Um, but this learning style one in particular um, among educators was very salient, educators and the public, as well as those from neuroscience backgrounds. So I wanna now just feature these and walk through each one and talk through the science of why we, um, what we understand from, about these concepts. Okay, the first one, um, this idea about letter reversals in dyslexia. First, let me define dyslexia. Dyslexia is a disability, a learning disability, that is defined at the single word level. That means if you have dyslexia, the defining feature is that you have re trouble reading accurately and or fluently at the single word level, not stories, paragraphs, sentences, single words. So your accuracy or and or your fluency are impaired. And um, 
Some people with dyslexia additionally have challenges with the orthography of language, how you use the written symbols of a language to represent the sounds. So they might have reversals, they might have um, confusions otherwise, but it's not a defining feature. It's a feature that may be true for some people with dyslexia. So that's one feature to highlight. The other is that there's something really special about our brains that we can think about in regards to reading. Well, many things, but regarding this particular point, if I take any item, let's say this clicker here, and I show it to you like this, and then I flip it like this, it's still a clicker, and I flip it any which way, nothing about what this is changes. But with our letters, like B and D and P, if I just flip something on an axis, all of a sudden, it's something entirely different. Its identity has changed. And the reason the brain's relevant for explaining and thinking this through is that our visual system is really robust and it operates on many rules, including the idea that if I change my orientation or my perception or on an axis something flips, I have to maintain that it's the same exact thing. Otherwise, I'd have a lot of trouble functioning in my world. If I walked and that table had a different perspective and it's then no longer a table, I'd have to encode or learn things in a completely different way. The brain is wired to be really robust to changes in orientation because that is what maintains identity of an item. Until kids come to school and learn their letters and that takes a really long time, even for kids who are developmentally having no challenges with reading. So the whole letter orientation challenge is a feature of some people with dyslexia, and also it's not developmentally inappropriate or surprising that some kids up until about second grade show that feature. So it's not just those with dyslexia, and developmentally it's so it's so hard to overwrite this rule that dictates how the visual system works um, that it has to be something that is worked on over years of exposure and working with the language, which is why up until even into second grade, you might see kids who are typically developing to this. Does that sound all right? Okay, all right, so um, subscribing to this might have some negative consequences, including de uh, delaying identification of struggling readers who don't display this and potentially diverting resources to ineffective interventions. I wanted to spend definitely some time on this learning style story and think through together with you how we can understand this um, and kind of share our perspectives. So this idea that is phrased this way, Individuals learn better when they receive information in their preferred learning style. The idea being that I prefer to see things. I'm a visual learner. In my educational setting, if my teacher prioritizes exposing me to information visually, I will learn that information much better. Two parts of this work. Uh, one part works and one part doesn't. The idea that I match to my preferred learning style doesn't have research support. And I can also after that say, yet, in some future time, should there be some research study that supports it, that would be something to reevaluate. But to date, all the research that's directly tried to investigate, does matching children to their preferred learning style change their learning because of that matching does not have support. And that's why here, it's saying that there's a lack of support when you think of learning styles as a theory of instruction or how you instruct. If you subscribe to it as a theory of instruction, then the research doesn't support it. But there's a really big asterisk here because if in your attempts to ensure that each child has exposure to their preferred learning style and as a consequence you deliver instruction that's multimodal and multisensory and then assume that kids will kind of take what they want or can from that that's effective instruction subscribing to this because it's a theory about how the mind works so um, here it's saying, presenting material in novel ways through multiple modalities, thereby providing opportunities for repetition is linked to improved learning and memory in cognitive educational literatures. So the learning style story doesn't work if you think of it as a theory of instruction, but does as a consequence of using it work if you think of it as a theory of how the mind works in terms of being exposed to multiple ways of getting information in with repeated exposure. How does that sync with your senses? Okay, who wants to share any thoughts on that? Yes? So it sounds like what you're saying is that the idea of being an auditory or visual learner is not true, but in a teacher's attempt to 
address that myth. Um, they're actually just presenting whatever their instruction is in so like in a more robust way because they're approaching it from different angles. Is that accurate? Yes. How come then we all think the other one? <laughs> I How thought that was like a more progressive understanding of education was that like some children are visual, some are auditory. Like how has that become such a... Well, it might be that people Thank you. feel that they are and there's no reason to counter that. I, I, if I say I prefer to see things visually, there's nothing to argue with. Right, right, right. And so teachers are so in tune to their students and, per, and being tuned to preferences is part of that profile. The, challenge is when the theory falls apart if it's the theory of instruction we're always going to instruct with that child just exposed to visual because that's what they because they are a visually preferred learner that child will just expose to auditory because they're an auditorily preferred learner that doesn't actually play out in research that you learn better if you pair kids with that single modality but in context where teachers try to make available a range of modalities for the class and therefore everyone gets exposed to multiple modalities because they're assuming that the kids who are visual will use that or the ones who are auditory will use that, that ends up working with the consequence because if you expose kids with multi-sensory, multimodal instruction, that has effects in boosting learning and memory. Sound okay? Yes. Okay, other people, comments or thoughts, yes? Um, oh, so Mike's coming through. Oh, right here. Hi. Um, I was I was thinking of it. Uh, one of my, my head of school had a similar talk with us about a year ago on this, and was saying like in a similar way, you know, kids might might say I love writing about animals, and then you're like, oh great, they're like they don't love writing, but they love writing about animals, and give them all of those. But then when they get to high school or wherever next, they haven't ever been exposed to writing about other topics that might not be what their preferred topics are, but are something that like the world will present them with and therefore they should be exposed to. It's like an analogy. That's a really helpful one. Thank you for sharing that. And comment. Um, I was just gonna follow up to Ali's question, which is, is there a social aspect to that? Because you were saying when you're thinking about addressing um, or presenting different modalities to the classroom, would that be different if you just had one student and you kind of spiraled the content first by doing something visual and then afterwards, but it would be a single student versus uh, a classroom environment? That's the kind of brilliant questions educators would ask. I don't know that that's been done in the research realm. Thank you for asking that. Um, hi, I was going to ask, I, I have um, a survey that I give to my students on the first day of class every year, and one thing I see all the time is a student self-identifying as a visual learner, an auditory learner, or something like that. Um, and I remember hearing this for the first time in grad school. We had a professor who was just like, there are not different learning styles. Uh, there's only one learning style, but being exposed to lots of, diff basically this, different modes is great. But I'm wondering if there's any research on whether a student can kind of placebo affect themselves in some way when they have strongly self-identified or had a teacher who had this misconception identify them as a visual learner or something like that, um, if that can affect the way that they learn. What I love about what you're saying is that you as an instructor, when you work with your students, are trying to learn about them. How do they identify? What do they prefer? And learning preferences exist. I can certainly, all of us can think about circumstances, materials, and otherwise that we prefer and that we feel like we grow with better in our educational environment. It just gets to be a trouble, and, and also, I can imagine also it's empowering for students to be heard. So they're expressing something about what their preferences, it, preferences might be and you're responding to it in a way that shows them, you hear them, you see them, and you're following up on that. Um, it just gets to be the reason behind why you might be then um, using your instructional approaches. Uh, let's see, things can go wrong and there won't be, let's see, nope, let me try one more time, okay. If then their exposure to curricula are tailored in ways that restrict them from multiple exposures or different ways, and you just only ever assign them to auditory or visual or kinesthetic, which I, I doubt you practice that, right? But if that were the way it would play out because of the subscription to this idea, then that would be an approach that doesn't have support that endorses learning in an optimal way. Yeah. Hi, and um, the mic's right behind you. I feel like it's important to have a flexible mindset because if you're thinking about what type of learner you are, you have to think about the context within which you're learning because mm -hmm. 
you know, I, my colleague is a shop teacher, and I know that my student who presents himself or herself in one way and has a preference perhaps in one modality may be very different when working in the wood shop mm -hmm. or very different when working in the art room or with a math teacher. Mm -hmm. So I, I tend to help my students understand that, similar to what you said about multimodality, is that you may connect to one thing, but it's important to be aware of the others because you may be... That, that self-awareness mm -hmm. will help you grow into being a flexible learner. I totally agree with that. In fact, whenever I think of why is a student performing a certain way, I actually have three parts of the equation. You identify two. One is who the student is. The second is what the context is. But the third is what is the task. Because I could have you reading a sentence, I can have you reading a story, and your only goal is to find how many times the is in there. Versus tell me about the d definition of democracy based on your analysis of this um, research uh, um, article. And so the interaction of those three are a really powerful way to think about what circumstances a child's under, what skills that they bring to the table, and what's being asked of them to understand what might be working and what might not be working. So thank you for that really great point. One more point. Yes, another question. Hi. A question. Um, does, is preference the same as strength? Because Great uh, question. If not, if so, it would seem to me that it should be. That that is surely why we um, give children listening comprehension assessments and, and so on. Mm -hmm. And if, in fact, we see, as we do, a huge difference between some children's ability to listen and absorb versus others, mm -hmm. then clearly they have, in fact, exactly what we're talking about here, which is a preference that is backed up by, supported by their ability to uh, use that modality extremely effectively. And that's a huge, that's a, so we want to be able to capitalize on strengths, also to help make up for areas of challenge. Um, one interesting thing is that if you, um, there isn't, a lot of syncing between what your perceived preferences may be and how they actually help you. And so the preference is not the same as strength. It's um, not always the same. And in fact, it's not always accurate. Um, there's a different study I can refer to that we're writing up right now. We've been exploring digital text modification. So there's the dyslexia font, and you could change the spacing between words or between letters to support students who may have learning disabilities or reading challenges. And we want to know, do any of them work? And do they work with children with LD? And are people's perceptions of what they think will help them actually syncing with what's working? And that particular point about the preferences had no relationship to what actually helped them. They weren't actually predicting accurately um, in that context what was useful and what wasn't. So preferences can come for so many reasons. Sometimes maybe it's aligned with the strength, um, but uh, it's not a consistent identification. Yes, but I know that therefore, if we have strengths... Yes. And those strengths are real, yes. then that is a single modality, essentially. So if we take away the preference part of your question, then it's not a myth. It is, in fact, true, then, surely, that some people have great strength in certain areas. Some people have great strength in all of them, lucky for them. But for those kids who have strengths in listening comprehension or visual or so forth, surely we should be teaching to that. What I love about your point is you're highlighting that we we don't want to focus so much on what's, what areas of deficit there are, but strengths matter a lot. What I would, re, what I would think through is um, when we come at this from an assessment perspective or a clinical perspective or one where we parse out ideas, vision's very big just like thinking is too big. I would say, okay, if someone's, if we're gonna break down someone's strengths and challenges, we then have to go into the more nuanced um, subcategories of each of those things. So what about visual processing? Is it because colors work for you? Is it because seeing something visually, spatially is working for you? Is it because you need to hold on to something so the tactile piece is actually what's doing it. There are a lot more nuanced ways to break it down. So that is also another reason why this, this categorical piece into three, visual, auditory, or kinesthetic, I find, and from the research, kind of speaking from that perspective, don't get at a refined enough level to inform us on what actually might be the part of that that's working so well for people or that they prefer or they, they subscribe to. Is that? Okay, 
All right, so with that, I say that we continue that discussion over the cocktail hour, and I'll continue walking us through a few more things. Um, we're, we're gonna finish in just a few minutes, so we'll have our break time immediately after this as well. Um, so the other myth I wanted to highlight was this idea that we only use 10% of our brain, and I wanted to share a um, question. Sorry, a question and kind of a comment. Um, in our last sessions, we asked that if you have a question that you didn't get to ask out loud, be sure to um, jot it down on one of the post-its and stick it up here on these easels so that we can go back to the, you won't, we won't lose them, but, um, but our speakers can refer to them so that um, in, in subsequent uh, presentations, those questions can be um, in some way addressed. Thank you. Is that okay? I'd love that. I'd love to follow up on all questions that are posted that we don't address in the immediate time. Um, so this myth about the 10% of our brain, um, we had a mixed response for, for all of our answers. This one, imagine you're seeing this brain which is just like many others that you have seen what, that are published in the media and different outlets. And what you're noticing here is that most of the, gray, the brain is gray, but there are some spots that have bright red tone, red yellow scales. My question to you is what is that showing exactly? And I have a mini, um, I, have, I have an arrow that's pointing at one of the answers. You can suspend your arrow viewing for a moment and make believe it's not there and just think through, if you had to guess which one of those answers might be the best one, what is it actually showing? Which answer might you have chosen? And the reason I'm highlighting this is because I think one way in which the myth of using only 10% of our brain may have come, where that may have come from, is when people publish pictures of the brain, they usually show grayscale figures that have some blobs highlighted and others not. And, and it's, most of the brain is not activated in these pictures. And therefore, we must not be using all our brain because we're only ever seeing the pictures with parts of it with, um, activated with those blobs. What are those blobs, though? And that's what I want to just unpack for you here. Um, here are some options. It, the, the answer is E. Okay, so there we all have it. But the options to think about is it could be showing activations in the brain. It could be showing blood flow. It could be showing activation of neurons. It could be showing reactivity in the brain. Or it could just be a statistical map. Why is that one right and the other one's wrong? So let me explain all the wrong ones first. Um, when people informally talk about the brain and refer to these bl blobs on the brain, they'll usually say the brain is activated in these spots and they'll refer to the blobs. The actually precise answer is the brain's active everywhere all the time and these blobs happen to be showing only the, only the parts of the brain that are statistically more engaged for one task versus another. So it's not simply brain activation, because I would show the whole entire brain. Uh, instead, it's just showing a statistical test that is revealing the regions that are more active for one task versus another. For example, reading versus looking at um, made up letters. And so that's why the first answer is not the best answer because the whole brain's active, that's not quite right. Blood flow is not quite the right answer either. Um, for, for imaging tools like MRI and functional MRI in particular, you are measuring how the blood flow changes as you're doing different activities. And what happens is when you're reading, parts of the brain that are required for reading, that are the most active to process print and sound and meaning, um, initially have a depletion of blood that's oxygenated and that is then followed up by this huge overflow and influx of blood with oxygen to those very same regions. So fMRI picks up on that overflow of blood with oxygen in it. And so this blood flow story, again, is not quite right because the whole brain is flooded with uh, blood all the time. But, the, but what's being measured actually in these blobs is blood flow changes that indicate brain activation for one task like reading versus a different task like looking at uh, made up words or letters. And the third one is not right, uh, that it's activation of neurons because MRI as a tool doesn't have that level of precision it only gets to the level of looking um, at collections of neurons, but never to the point of seeing them distinctly in individually. Um, and the choice D is inaccurate because nothing about MRI is radioactive. There's no reactivity. That's more x-rays and CAT scans, but not MRI. So this whole idea 
that these are always just showing you statistical maps. And it's as if you took a piece of graph paper and you put it over a brain and each box in every single little box, like on graph paper how small they are, in every single box is how statistics are done. In each box, it asks the question, is one task relative, having more blood flow than the other task? Make it red. If not, leave it gray. Next box, same thing. So if you look really closely at these images, you'll see that they're box-like on the bottom periphery of the blobs because it's in each little box that that question is asked, where is there statistically more blood flow for one task versus another? Okay, so does that help address this idea? A little bit, okay. So next one, the idea that some of us are left-brained and some are right-brained, and this helps explain differences in how we learn. Um, this is uh, an MRI, and you can see that there's parts of it that are blacked out. That's because the brain is missing there. This is a child who has had a hemispherectomy, and they have, um, for extreme medical reasons that are related to seizure activity, um, had to have the whole hemisphere removed. And these are the only people who I work with who are truly left-brained or right-brained, okay? Because they could, they could honestly show that and demonstrate that that's how it works. The idea of a heuristic that some of us left brain might be more attuned to language and those who are right brain more, might be more artsy or otherwise, um, may be useful for just thinking creatively about differences or strengths or otherwise. But when it comes to the, the science supporting those sorts of categorizations between left and right brained, they don't play out. So it's similar to the learning styles one, it's a myth for, for those reasons. Any questions or otherwise about that one? Okay, so, um, the last one I want to review was this idea that listening to classical music increases children's reasoning ability. This got a lot of attention, especially when the initial study came out um, some time ago. In fact, um, in um, one of the uh, cities in the country, they, every newborn baby was sent a CD with Mozart to ensure that they were going to be uh, receiving an advantage from having listened to that classical music. But let's just go to the original study to see where did this all come from. So in this study, um, they played a specific piece by Mozart and they gave this, um, they did this study with just 36 adults and they had a benefit um, that lasted for 15 minutes for one particular task. And then there was no enhancement at all that it didn't generalize. So this idea that one particular temporary boost happened for a subset of adults, then generalized to listening to Mozart makes you smarter was a really far leap, right? You start here and you end up here. And um, uh, si since this study came out, many others have followed that tried using p music that you like the best or music of different varieties and otherwise, um, and none have so far showed that there's some generalizable impact on your general intelligence. Um, so that's where that myth is coming from. Okay, so the thing is that neuromyth endorsement was pretty prevalent, so this is just showing the percent of neuromyths endorsed across those three groups. But the thing I wanted to share was that in the analysis of all the neuromyths that were asked, which were even more than those that you did in the quiz just now, these in particular clustered. That means if you endorsed one of these neuromyths, you tended to endorse the rest of them. And so these include, using these, these are the ones that we just reviewed, except for one that I didn't touch on. Um, but these end up being clustered together, so endorsement of one tends to come with the endorsement of the others. So um, in the analysis of what predicted um, who was least prone to endorsing myths, um, it had something to do with the type of myth and the background. So neuroscientists tended to be more accurate when you ask them about neuroscience-related myths, which is good and a relief. Um, and also the quality of media exposure was interesting for people who read um, first-hand science from journals and otherwise, they were least likely to endorse myths. And people who read sort of like the telephone game, I'll say it, and then by the time it gets to the publication on a blog, it may be, dis um, it may be kind of a different message. So the, um, so for those, for educators who, who read many neuroscience 
um, who read peer-reviewed scientific journals or had neuroscience courses, they were more resilient against the myths because, of course, many of them were brain-related, so they were able to bounce back from that. So with that, I wanted to just share with you a couple of resources um, I mentioned the ones on this slide. So these are the resources from the National Center for Learning Disabilities and where I took a lot of the infographics that are available to everybody. And then on the previous slide, I'll share, oh, and this is the article where I'm describing our survey from the general public and um, educators and neuroscience training trained people. And then I also just want to share with you a list of other resources, um, including the International Dyslexia Association has a resource called the Knowledge and practice standards, and this is one where um, they've disseminated a list of the skills and of the knowledge that they think are important for people in the reading domain to have, and uh, especially those who pursue becoming a reading specialist. So I flagged that just to identify um, and narrow in and provide you with a resource for if I wanted if I wanted to know what I know about reading, what should I know? And this is a kind of list with the skills and knowledge that might help address that. So.